Hello, everyone. G'day, everyone. Welcome back to Ideas Matter. Welcome back. We are doing today The Birth of Tragedy by Friedrich Nietzsche. I've been teasing this one for a little while on the Instagram, and here it is. The return back to the big dog. Yeah, we're back on Nietzsche. I have to say that compared to uh, the other Nietzsche texts that we read, mm. I like this much, much more. Yeah. That, I f- the other one was a lot more sort of subdued tonally. Yeah. I feel like a lot of the... like. A lot of the stuff I enjoy about reading Nietzsche is when he gets really worked up and passionate and you can like, see it in the text. Yeah, for sure. And he was very passionate in this one. Yeah, there's as, as I wrote in, um, on the little Instagram caption that I, that I wrote, that like, there's a sort of his pro, like, he has a literary style of prose which makes the book, it makes the work. And the, the guy who wrote the intro to this Penguin edition says that in Nietzsche, well, in particularly... In the birth of tragedy, uh, the medium is the message, mm. and like Nietzsche's style is the me- is the message of this book, mm. because he's it's a book about aesthetics, it's a book yeah. about art, and he's trying to show how art can actually reveal the nature of reality to us, and so it's not necessarily a criticism, as some people might imply it is, to say Nietzsche is writing in a literary sense because that is actually sort of serving to make his point that through art we can understand reality. Yeah, for sure. And he really is like a medium, medium is the message thinker. Like it's the same with his aphorisms in his later works because he's, uh, at least he develops into like an anti-systemic philosopher. Like you can't kind of collapse reality into just like a system based on rational thought. Yeah. And the aphorisms are part of communicating that. Like they're individual little snippets you know they they don't come together really into like one whole sort of like propositional argument front to back yeah that's very true um and it's not surprising that he like he makes a lot of allusions to like buddhism as well mm. as as i've like always say in these episodes you know i relate things to their similarity to like you know taoism or confucianism but like eastern philosophy in general mm. i mean there's a bit of that in this cause, well, well we'll get into that but um through the Schopenhauer influence, you know, who in turn was very influenced by like Buddhist and Indian philosophy. Mm, interesting. Um, but let's let's jump right in. Uh, so, Birth of Tragedy. A little bit of detail on it. It was written in uh, eighteen seventy one. Uh, this is his first published book. So this is well before his sort of main line of like Zarathustra, Gay Science, Beyond Good and Evil, on the genealogy of morals, which we've also done. So. This is quite a bit of time before that. He's like a 27-year-old hotshot young professor. Um, Man, being a professor at 27, that's fucked. He got made professor at 24, I think. Well, <laughs> but he, by this point, he still hadn't published anything. That's insane. That would just yeah. that, that can't happen today. Yeah, I know. It's ridiculous. But he's, he was a precocious man. Mm. Um, but everybody was sort of like waiting around with bated breath to see what this like young hotshot philologist would come out with. Yeah, and so we should we should say that he he actually was not a professor of philosophy. He yeah, was a correct. professor of philology, which is correct me if I'm wrong. It's like it's kind of like etymology. It's it, it's like yeah, kind of like linguistics mixed with a bit of like classical studies. Exactly, yeah. and that's that's relevant because the birth of tragedy. He's talking about Greek tragedy, and so Nietzsche, though he was not trained as a philosopher, what he did do was read ancient Greek tragedy and philosophy. That was his. That was his scholarly training. Was reading those texts in ancient Greek. Yeah, yeah. He's he was intimately familiar with ancient Greek culture, ancient Greek written works, including philosophy. Mm. Um, he he sort of geared towards the pre-Socratics, but uh, that that'll reveal itself as we read it a bit more. Um, but yeah, everybody was waiting around for this text, which he wrote when he was twenty-seven. And it came out, and everyone was like, "What the hell was that?" Like, <laughs> Anticlimactic. Yeah, like, and and the he kind of got pilloried by the academy for it because he doesn't really give like evidence mm. uh, and like proof for the <laughs> things he put forth, puts forth. But I feel like that's not really the point. Um, he's making, he's using the sort of ancient Greek thing as sort of like a framing for some broader points about like aesthetic philosophy and whatnot. Um, but even though the Academy didn't love it, uh, this was actually a very, very renowned text for a lot of artists um, around that time and afterwards. Uh, for example, there's a very famous German novelist from the 
first bit of the 20th century called Thomas Mann. And he has his most famous work is called The Magic Mountain. And that's he got the name from this book. There's actually two points in here where Nietzsche uses the phrase calling something like a magic mountain. Oh, I um, didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, also quite a number of composers, painters, uh, mostly in the early 20th century, uh, very much inspired by Birth of Tragedy. So I feel like that kind of, I don't know, would have made Nietzsche happy. Like Academy didn't love it, but he inspired the artist with his book about art. I think it would have really made Nietzsche happy. Um, in preparation for this, I was watching a, a lecture series by Raymond Goyce on Nietzsche, uh, which was recommended in one of um, Cuck Philosophy slash Jonas Chaker's uh, YouTube episodes where he does like top 10 books I read in 2021. Mm-hmm. And he read Philosophy and Real Politics by Raymond Goyce. Um, and he mentioned that Goyce has like a lecture series on Nietzsche. So I checked out that lecture series and um, I really recommend it, by the way. I think we'll put a link in the in the show description. But only after you listen to this. Oh, yeah. Listen, listen to, to this and then go check listen out Listen to this show. first and then go listen to that Cambridge philosopher. <laughs> uh, you know, what, what has he got on Ideas Matter? Um, but he made a really good point where... He was sort of saying that, like, you can contrast Nietzsche with sort of... This is after... Nietzsche's writing, like, after the downfall of German idealism. Uh, And German idealism, like Kant and Hegel, sort of think that, like, there's this uh, reason to history and Hegel famously said that philosophy is its age comprehended in thought. So the good philosopher to Hegel like systematizes and expresses in its most purified form the mood of the era, right? Um, Whereas Nietzsche thought the complete opposite and Goyce makes the point that like the highest compliment that Nietzsche would give of someone or would hope to receive, I can't remember the German word for it, but is to be a philosopher out of sync with their own time. Mm. And if you look at how popular Nietzsche is today compared to his own time, it's quite ironic that he would be very, very happy <laughs> yeah, with, sure. with, with the fact that he was out of sync with his own time. Yeah, he, he does have a line somewhere in Beyond Good and Evil where he says, people aren't going to begin to appreciate me until the 21st century. Really? Yeah. Wow. He called it. He called a lot of stuff. He called a lot of stuff. Yeah. He, there's a lot in here that's like super prescient um, yeah. and sort of foreboding of like the horrors of the early 20th century. Mm. But we'll get to that. Um, so yes, so as you were saying, Alex, sorry that... He wrote this, wasn't super received by the Academy, but artists liked it. Yeah. Um, um, and it also comes before he sort of like fully developed his thought. Like you can read this and it still feels like later nature, right? There's still some things in here that uh, his later ideas in embryo, um, in sort of baby form. But there's other things in here that he will make a very dramatic break with. Um, and actually 15 years after he wrote this, he came back to it. Um, this is after he'd written like a lot of his main... Uh, sort of mature texts after he'd already developed himself as a thinker. He wrote uh, an attempt at a self-criticism. And we'll get back to that after we've done the main text. But in it, he sort of like repu- uh, repudiates uh, a lot of the stuff that he thought and argued in this. Um, one of the main things, and, and this is important before we go in, is that he... Not so much... Uh, he, he's not so much having his like own putting forth his own like unique philosophy, but he's building on Schopenhauer. Yeah. So Schopenhauer at this point was like a massive, massive influence. Um, and there are, there are a couple of points where he'll just start like block quoting like, yeah, it's two, like two, three paragraphs from Schopenhauer. Yeah, there are entire pages or like double pages that's just a quote from Schopenhauer. Yeah. Um, and Schopenhauer was kind of expanding on Kant in his own way. Mm. Um, but Schopenhauer also had, as I said before, a big influence from Indian and Buddhist philosophy. So there's a lot of stuff in here about, um, like, the Kantian distinction between, like, phenomena and, and noumenon. Yeah. So, like, there's our world of experience, the, like, the, the world where we can look at things and uh, understand them uh, with <laughs> sort of mental concepts and whatnot. And then there's the noumenon. The things in themselves. Things in themselves. So... It's sort of like the, there's the world with the goggles, uh, that's the world we see every day, and then there's the world without the goggles, and we can't really... You know, it's, it's a big question as to whether or not we can really get to the world without the goggles. Yeah. Um, it, Goyce makes an interesting point about, about Schopenhauer's influence on Nietzsche um, because Kant is mentioned in this book quite a bit, and obviously the idea of trying to access 
capital R reality um, is something that Kant's interested in and it's something that Nietzsche is talking about. But according to Goyce, we have like strong historical evidence to suggest that Nietzsche never read Kant. Mm. The Kant that he is familiar with is the Kant interpreted by Schopenhauer. Um, apparently, we had, like when he died, we had access to his personal library. There was no Kant. We had access to um, his like library record logs, books that he'd borrowed. There was no Kant there either. Uh, so the Kant that he's talking about is very much the Kant that you find in Schopenhauer. I write it. Very interesting. Talking very confidently about a thinker you've never read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, ne- we never do that. <laughs> We've never... D- guys, we never do that on this show. We would never do that to you. <laughs> but anyways... <laughs> um, yeah, so Kant, uh, through Schopenhauer, uh, but more importantly, Schopenhauer himself, and there's a big Schopenhauer idea that life is fundamentally suffering. Um, yes. Uh, and that's, like, very Buddhist influence. Uh, the way to happiness is through sort of like renouncing your will because through willing, you sort of lean into that suffering, mm. um, which if you're at all familiar with later nature, you hear you, the idea that he would write something like that would strike you as being um, quite out of character. Yeah. Uh, so quite a few things in here that he moved beyond in terms of thought. But again, there's a lot of stuff that he held on to. Uh, but anyways, uh, I feel like that's... Some good historical context. Yeah, that's, that's the context for you. Let's jump right into it. Uh, he also loves uh, Wagner. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, that's another big big break. Like, So this is called The Birth of Tragedy. Yeah. And he thinks tragedy died because Euripides fucked it up. Um, but he sees the rebirth of tragedy occurring uh, through the music of uh, Richard Wagner, which uh, he doesn't really do a good job, in my opinion, of saying why. But he loves Richard Wagner. Uh, he was friends with him, would stay at his holiday house. Uh, but that's also a huge influence that, 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 is, that is on nature at the time uh, because there's a lot in here about just how great music is. Yeah. He loves music as a form of art. He thinks it's one of like the highest form of art. Yeah. And Wagner is another thing that he had a massive break with because he famously had a very big breakdown in his relationship with Wagner and then uh, it sort of obsessed him. Like he, he could never get over it, really. Um, and even after like a, dec- a decade after Wagner died, Nietzsche was still writing like books and essays about why Wagner ended up sucking. It's pretty weird. Yeah, but safe to say, uh, very big figure in his life. Mm. So, how is this so-called tragedy born? Yeah. Um Well, that's a great question, Alex. (laughs) So tragedy, he's talking about Greek tragedy. um, Which he sees to be like the highest form of art. The highest form of art, yeah. I'll do my best to explain why he thinks that is. But look, bear in mind, like he says, he says that the death of tragedy began with Euripides. And Euripides is the only tragedy that I've read. (laughs) I had to read that in high school. I read Medea. I can kind of get what he's coming from because I was familiar with, with Medea. But basically, um, he he uses these two Greek gods to like be stand-ins for what he sees as like two impulses in all art. Uh, The Apollonian is that how you say it properly? Or yeah, it it comes. It's different in different translations. In this one, it's Apolline, Apolline, and then Dionysiac. But I've also heard Apollonian and Dionysian. Dionysian, yeah. Um, But really, this is coming from the two Greek gods, Apollo and Dionysus. Yeah. who are both sons of Zeus to different mothers. Um, and Apollo is the god of, like, reason, order, whereas Dionysus is, I don't want to say, like, irrationality, but more sort of, like, chaos. And irrationality. Like, ir- yeah, exactly. Irrationality, like, not irrational, but the absence of rationality, chaos, um, drunkenness, etc. Yeah. And so you have these two, like, artistic impulses um, and Nietzsche thinks that what is so fantastic about Greek tragedy is that it encompasses both. So I think it would be easy to read this text and to think that he hates the Apollonian and loves the Dionysian, but... Which is n- not the case. Not the case. A lot of people come away with that, though. Yeah, they do. And I don't blame them because I sort of... It seems like at points that he's saying that. But I think what he what he's saying is that 
the, you get the content of art, like its its core message, comes from the Dionysian. Um, but if you just have the Dionysian, it's irrational, it's chaotic, it's overwhelming. So you need the Apollinean to give it form. So if you just had the Dionysian, it would be it would be content without form. So to actually make the message of art digestible for us humans, you need the Apollinean. You need some imposition of rationality and structure, right? And so in in tragedy that you know takes the form of the tragic hero right like he says they like perform a, a metaphysical sacrifice uh, because they experience this huge tragedy and through tragedy they like see the world as it really is which for nature is like suffering Exi- nature at this point nature exactly nature at this point sees the world as fundamentally just being like pain and suffering for all eternity and that's the that's like that is life. That is existence. So you can see why he, he's sometimes regarded as being a proto-existentialist. So the tragic hero in Greek tragedy experiences that. Um, but then, look, I'm not I'm not 100 percent clear on this. Like, basically, they 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 experience this tragedy. They experience the horror of reality. Um, but then they go on living anyway. Uh, and they find meaning in the tragedy. And so, like, as an audience, w- that we're sort of, like, not spectating, but, like, he, he sees the tragic hero as performing a, a sacrifice for us. So th- the beauty of Greek tragedy is that it shows us the truth about reality, that it's suffering, it's horrible. Um, it's not this, like, Hollywood film with a happy ending. No, like, it shows us the, the, the truth about human existence. It's painful, it's horrible. But then we have this cathartic moment through the tragic hero where they decide, in spite of all this suffering, life is worth living anyway. Um, and so through these two artistic impulses, tragedy, like, enables us to do this. Uh, it, would you say that's a fair a fair rundown? Yeah, yeah. Um, I... I wouldn't say cathartic, though, because that implies what he's sort of partly going against in this is like uh, the vein of like aesthetic criticism mm. that uh, puts on some sort of moral frame onto the art that they're judging. Yeah. Whereas he, sure. he, his view is that fundamentally there's there's no moral point to art. The art for art to be art, it first and foremost has to be aesthetic. Um, anything else is secondary to that, and I feel like the the idea of catharsis is in some sense like a moral moral framing. Okay, sure. No, fair point. Yeah. Uh, it, it's but it's just, it's just that, yeah, that, I feel like the rest of it was a good rundown, but like just that in particular I think is important to um, uh, get, uh, get specific on. Fair enough. Um, it's summarised pretty well, I think, by... Let me just get you the name, dear listeners, of who wrote this introduction. Uh, uh, Mr. Penguin Classics. Mr. Penguin Classics. Uh, no, it was written by Michael Tanner, uh, who is actually he's a lecturer in philosophy, uh, but he's also an expert on music and literature, and he's written the Wagner Companion. Damn. So that's his interest in Nietzsche, or specifically this text, I should say. Anyway, so he just he's start, he's summarising Nietzsche's message and what Nietzsche's view on art, and he says beauty in Nietzsche's early view is both an imitation for the horror of life and a consolation for it. Uh, art at its greatest tells the truth and makes it possible to bear it. And that latter sentence I really think encapsulates what I was trying to say before, that Nietzsche sees tragedy by its very name, like by its name, it's tragic, life is tragic. So tragedy tells us the truth, but at the same time makes it possible for us to accept this truth. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And if if any of you have ever known um, religious people, particularly someone who's uh, Christian, uh, you can see this in the, a similar vein in the idea of people like reflecting on like Christ on the cross when they're going through some trouble or tribulation or like the 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 trials of the Virgin Mary. Um, yeah, it's I, a similar sort of thing going on here. Like the he sees tragedy as fundamentally like a mythic art form. Myth is very important for him, um, and the purpose partly of myth is to provide some sort of framework for understanding your own experience and being able to bear it. Yeah. So that's part of the value of tragedy for nature it shows you something terrible happening to someone else um even though they may be like or maybe in particular like um uh like oedipus in uh sophocles play series 
um, someone who is very noble, noble character, um, someone who's very upright, uh, and yet going through terrible experiences in that. That being able to see that and experience that um, for Nietzsche is something that is very helpful for people in their own lives who are going through some sort of tragic experience. Yeah, absolutely. Or like not, not necessarily some tragic experience, but face to face with the tragedy of existence. Yeah, the tragedy of existence, um, which I want to come back to because Nietzsche himself sort of abandons that. Um, but this is quoting from Nietzsche himself here, which we just have to do because like wow it's just we're gonna do it a couple times. it's just written so well um so the, he, he's talking about remember before we were saying the distinction between like a phenomenon and the noumenon mm. or the sensible world and things as they actually are he goes well let's just imagine that like we were actually capable of glimpsing reality in itself um nature says aware of truth from a single glimpse of it all man can now see is the horror and absurdity of existence and then he goes on to say here, in this supreme menace to the will, there approaches a redeeming, healing enchantress, art. She alone can turn these thoughts of repulsion at the horror and absurdity of existence into ideas compatible with life. These are the sublime, the taming of horror through art and comedy, the artistic release from the repellence of the absurd. You could, almost, very... you could almost end there, really. Yeah. Like, it sort of sums up what his view of art is. Mm. But also that's like through and through Schopenhauer, mm. like the idea of art being the the last sort of bastion for human comfort in a cruel world. Yeah. Life is suffering, but art makes it bearable, which, you know, like I don't necessarily agree with him and later Nietzsche wouldn't agree either that life is essentially suffering. But life does have a lot of suffering, does have a lot of tragedy. And yeah, like art in a, in its broader sense does make life bearable. Mm. It gives it a lot of meaning. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, and he particularly sees this in music. Like he, just to go back to the idea of the um, uh, Apoll- Apollonian and Dionysian, which uh, I feel like there's a lot, like really a lot to go in with those two. Um, he, he attributes particular art forms, particular styles of art to each of them. So like Apollonian, which is like very orderly, um, uh, but not, not just orderly, but um, he, in part of the distinction that he draws between the Apollonian and Dionysian is the idea between like individuation and oneness. So Apollonian is like the sort of like individuating impulse. So me being me instead of you or this bottle on the table or the laptop that we're recording this with. Yeah. Right? It's it's the individual impulse and by that sort of like the, the, the impulse of... Um, order, imposition onto the world of ego. Um, And part of what he sees uh, in that as like an artistic representation is sculpture. So like sculpture is for him like the highest form of Apollonian art is you're taking like one thing and you're fashioning one thing out of it in clear lines and in in beautiful form. Um, But the Dionysian is formless, right? It's oneness. It's very, it's this primal, irrational sort of impulse when he sees music as the sort of highest ideal of the Dionysian. Um, but also he sees language. Language itself is something that's Apollonian, right? Because this is something that he kind of develops in his later work. Uh, language is... Uh, and language as a means of which we sort of like understand and uh, talk about and categorise the world is itself a sort of imposition. Like it doesn't... Reality as such, per nature doesn't actually have, like, a one-to-one accordance with language, mm. right? Yeah. You know, it, it's sort of like that Heidegger point where, you're like, the... Actually, this, this is just, like, an aphorism from Nietzsche and I think Beyond Good and Evil and, like, Heidegger picked it up and s- developed it a bit further. But language itself sort of frames our understanding of the world that, in a way that might not be accurate, like subject, verb, object. Something acts on another thing. Like, how... Yeah. D- like, is... Is that the way things really are, or is is our language like a sort of like imposition that frames of our understanding on which in which the world works? So he sees language as part of this uh, Apollonian sort of like individualizing force, um, and part of that as well th- through language is poetry. Um, and what do you get when you mix poetry and music? That's how he sees tragedy sort of developing, right? Because 
tragedy, Greek tragedy at the time was like a, like it, it was a stage thing, uh, but it was written quite often, or at least I've got a book of Sophocles and I have a flick through it and um, it's written in poetry. Uh, it's, it's not written in prose. But there's an important part of tragedy that he really goes on about and he sees as like the highest point of it, which is the tragic chorus. So at certain points throughout like a tragic text or, or a tragic performance rather, there would be uh, a quote-unquote chorus and this is uh, some sort of representation of something out there uh, commenting on the actions uh, of the play and of the characters, of the hero. Um, but the chorus is, as the name implies, a chorus. It was musical. So this sort of... This mixture of, like, the Apollonian with, like, the, the poetry, the individuation, because you have, like, one hero sort of going through it with the Dionysian impulse of the music of the chorus and all, all the tragedy and the suffering that the character goes through sort of melds together uh, to create this perfect mixture of the Apollonian and the Dionysian, which is tragedy. Um, and it's sort of... Y- y- there's the three main sort of great what we consider now the great um, Greek tragedians, or I think they're all Athenian, I'm pretty sure. Um, There's Aeschylus, who is Nietzsche's favourite. There's Sophocles, who's the second favourite. And then there's Euripides, who fucking sucks and (laughs) ruined everything forever. Man, I wish I could go back in time because I had to read Euripides in year 12 and everyone liked it, but I just hated it. (laughs) <laughs> and I could not for the life of me articulate why I hated it, but little did I know that I was just anticipating Nietzsche. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he's... Th- I actually had a similar sensation. Not, uh, I've never read Eu- uh, Euripides, but reading this and having things that I've thought for quite... Th- things I've felt for quite some time being put into words in, in yeah. like a very intelligible way. Like, yeah. yeah. The whole idea that art shouldn't be like rational art isn't some rational force so like that sort of like Dionysian impulse where you just kind of like get overcome um like in like you shouldn't really be able to like explain your art because then you're thinking about it too much and it's not really art at that point it's not like some pure aesthetic experience yeah I mean I guess you can kind of to just I don't know give a run-of-the-mill example like today TV shows and movies that try to too explicitly be like socio political critiques. Yeah. Like it, it's almost as if, I mean, it is as if like the artistic creative aspect is completely secondary. Like it's a distant second to the writers of this supposed piece of art making a rational criticism of society as it exists. And so for Nietzsche, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be art. And yeah. I, I, I agree with that. 100%. And that's a perfect segue into Euripides because that's part of what he pillories Euripides for doing. Um, so like I said, there's uh, his sort of trif- the trifecta of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. And he loves Aeschylus the most um, partly because he sees a few of the impulses he doesn't like coming through in Sophocles. Um, but there's a line from Sophocles... Uh, that he quotes in the text where he says, um, Aeschylus was a genius and did all the right... It's like I'm paraphrasing it. Aeschylus was a genius and did all the right things, but without knowing it. Mm. Um, And I feel like that's part of why Nietzsche rates Aeschylus so highly, because it was sort of this, like, instinctual outpouring of sort of artistic creation. Whereas Sophocles did largely the same thing, you know, kept this sort of, like, tragic impulse, but... Um, like still had this sort of creeping rationality coming in, uh, this creeping optimism, which he didn't like. And then we get to Euripides. So Euripides, per nature, uh, killed myth. And through killing myth, he killed tragedy. And through killing tragedy, he killed the Dionysian. And through killing the Dionysian, he killed the Apollonian. Uh, so he kind of just like knocked the whole house down, according to Nietzsche. And this is this is because, in Nietzsche's words, Euripides is knowingly or unknowingly, I think knowingly, being influenced by the philosophy of Socrates. Yeah. 
Um, and so I think the way to, the, I mean, you mentioned before optimism, right? Uh, and, and, and so what this is where sort of the metaphysical and the aesthetic come together in nature. And so Alex was talking about before how like language is an imposition on the world. And so Nietzsche talks about this principle of individuation. And so when we look at the world, we see like discrete objects and we metaphysicians sometimes use the phrase carve up reality, which I like. If you just imagine reality, it's like a blank sheet of paper. You can draw lines on it in any which way and then say this is reality, like there's an object over here, there's an object over here. Someone else can come along and draw object, draw a different set of lines and say, well, no, this is what reality looks like. But the point is that these are all just different ways of slicing up reality to make it intelligible to the human mind or to the human brain. Very much like William James. Yeah, exactly. It's a, very, it's a similar point to, to William James. Um, and so Nietzsche... Is, is saying, well, that's fine because we need that to actually like function and to make sense of reality uh, in a rational sense. But, but let's not confuse that carving up of reality with reality itself uh, because we see things as being discrete, distinct from one another. Reality is consisting of parts. That is just our slicing up of, of reality. Really what he sees is like an eternal oneness. Everything is just part of everything else. Um, and... That's, that is the insight that we get through tragedy. We realize that we're just... So he gives an example of like uh, ancient Greek festivals where people would lose their... Literally lose this subjective experience of being a single ego and lose themselves in this kind of like mass collective hysteria. Yeah. Right? Like the, this is like his sort of like highest example of like the Dionysian impulse at work. Yeah, you literally lose your individual ego and you realise that you are just part of this bigger collective thing. There's just a fundamental unity to existence, right? And so that's that's what Nietzsche is saying. Um, but the, the crucial point, to bring it back to where Alex was going with Euripides, was that this eternal oneness uh, it, it doesn't have... A morality built into it doesn't have any meaning built into it. That that comes from our own imposition, and so that's important because he's contrasting that with Socrates and Plato, who thought that if you understand reality in its purest form, knowledge will give you virtue, and virtue will make you happy. Mm. So there's a <laughs> you have this convergence on this like higher metaphysical plane of understanding reality as it is and being happy and being virtuous. They're all one and the same thing. But for Nietzsche's no, if you were to understand how reality actually is, all you would feel is sheer existential dread. Yeah. Uh, just rewinding a little bit back to when you were talking about that sort of like prime, like Dionysian impulse of like your, you know, out of uh, these like Greek and like ancient festivals where you get so caught up in the revelry that like the, the borders of your own self sort of dissolve away. Like that's, I feel like that's that's a very important point. And he says it's not necessarily you feel dread in that moment either. There's like an there's an ecstatic element to it. Mm. Feeling that there's it's a what he calls like a mix of dread and ecstasy. Yeah, it's like, both. Yeah, like it's very, yeah, it's it's a very intense experience that you can't sort of like um, separate that one from the other. Um, and he calls it a narcotic experience um, and also often literally like fueled by narcotics. Yeah. So you can think of like ancient religious festivals where they'd find some sort of like psychedelic plant that they'd use or wine um, and th- through this revelry, like quote, the rigid and hostile boundaries, end quote, break down. So like what remains is just sort of like primal oneness. Um if anyone's been to a rave, similar <laughs> feeling. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that seems very Dionysian. Um, mm. But I think I had this reading of this, and I wonder if you agree, because he uses the term at one point to describe these sort of festivals as like a purge, Yeah. right? And um, like Rick and Morty, right, the TV show, mm. very influenced by absurdism. Um, and there's this episode where they go to this planet on the night of the purge, right? And the reason why this society, well, so the, for those who haven't seen it, um, they go to this planet and it's the night of the purge where there is no law. So anything that you do on this night, fine, no consequences. So people just kill each other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's it's called the purge because as Rick explains in the show, they 
the reason they do this is to sort of release these, like, for want of a better word, evil impulses from you so that you can continue for the other 364 days of the year functioning as a normal human being. You kind of like purge this impulse from your system. And it seemed to me that Nietzsche was actually saying something sort of similar about the role of tragedy and about the role of these like festivals where you lose your sense of ego. They actually perform quite a useful function. Um, And the reason why I bring that up is because the reason why he dislikes Socrates and this equation of rationality with truth and happiness is because for him, that's ignoring one half of the equation. And if you just focus on rationality, if you just have a society that is completely rational all the time, what you're doing is you're suppressing these Dionysian impulses. And I, I got the sense that he was had this, this foreboding that in suppressing them, they're going to come out. And they're going to come out in an uncontrolled manner because you have this, you've had this naive optimism that if we're just rational all the time... We'll, we'll be happier, we'll have a better society, we're ignoring this Dionysian element. Um, so that's what I took away from it. No, for sure. Like, I think he definitely alludes to that, uh, where you, you can like suppress this impulse, yeah. but it's going to come out some way or the other. Exactly. So back to the reason no. why he doesn't like Euripides is because he sees that optimism of rationality through Socrates creeping in, right? Yeah, but just before that, I'll, part of why he didn't like Euripides is, as I said, he killed a myth. I just want to read out this quote um, as to why he sees myth, uh, myth in tragedy is important. Um, quoting from Nietzsche now. In these ideas, you know, talking about Dionysus and it's Apollonian and in the Greek tragedians, in these ideas we, have already, we already have all the component parts of a profound and pessimistic view of the world and at the same time the mystery doctrine of tragedy, the basic understanding of the unity of all things individuation seen as the primal source of evil, art as the joyful hope that the spell of individuation can be broken, and a presentiment of a restored oneness. And this always presents itself mythically, right? Through some, you know, it talks about like the story of Prometheus. Um, so not only does myth present itself uh, uh, in this sort of consolation way in tragedy, but in religion, in, you know, literally myth, of different peoples and when you kind of start to destroy the myth of a people or a religion you destroy that people or that religion and part of why he sees Euripides and this sort of Socratic impulse as being so bad is because it does that it destroys myth through its rational impulse because myth isn't rational right you know you you read uh some myth where there's like some miracle that occurs um and if your impulse is to be like no, that's that that couldn't possibly work. Uh, that I need did, to that didn't literally happen. Yeah, that yeah, literally like that <laughs> that didn't literally happen. That's the impulse that he fe- sees as being very destructive uh, to the cultural and sort of you know spiritual importance. Well, it's of it's, these it's, it's, it's it's sort of like how we were saying in our episode on uh, Augustine, right? That there's this kind of straw man that's that's given to you by 20th and 21st century atheists who go, oh, look at these, like, stupid Christians thinking that, like, the Bible is literal. But then you go and read, when was he writing? Like, the 3rd century or something? Um, 5th century. The 5th century? Yeah. Completely acknowledging that these things are analogies and they're mythic and that, that the truth contained in them is allegorical. I mean, it's just, it's just, like, untrue to say that people have people thought that myths were like literal statements of fact. Mm. That actually reflects our own obsession with rationality. Yeah, for sure. Um and part of why he dislikes Euripides is that he got rid of this myth and re- he replaced it with a sort of like social realism, right? So Sophocles and Aeschylus, they were very mythical tragedians. Uh, they would create tragedies about these mythic scenes. Whereas Euripides was like, no, 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 that's, that's irrational. It's, that's, not, that's not rational, so it's bad. We want to be presenting rationality to the people. Um, so he made tragedy a uh, sort of degenerated thing of the audience's everyday concerns, which defeats the purpose of myth because myth is something that isn't everyday. Myth is something that's grand, that's big picture, and through seeing it, you're able to relate any of your everyday concerns to it. If you have some sort of like social realist art, like Euripides kind of brought forward in his tragedy, that 
defeats the purpose of myth and for nature defeats the ultimate purpose of tragedy right you're you're not seeing something that you're like some grand display that you're ultimately able to relate to your own self and your own life and making your own way through the world um and he has this quote here about it uh, about like appealing uh euripides appealing to sort of like the common man in the audience quote the spectator now saw and heard his double on the euripidean stage and was overjoyed by his eloquence and Honestly, like you brought up Rick and Morty earlier, but that made me think of Rick and Morty. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah, just because, you know, like there's all the characters uh, at some point or another go on this grand impassioned spiel mm. about something, like some, some deep truth about like, like this like cynical sort of uh, talk about like life and like the universe. And I don't know, I just sort of felt like that. And there's like a lot of... I, I, I do like I, I do like the first two seasons of Rick and Morty, but like there's also like a lot of dumbasses I know who were into it, like dude, this is like the deepest show ever. Yeah, dude, dude, yeah, no one's. And then the show starts taking the piss out yeah. of like its own audience, which I love. But yeah. like the last se- the most recent season, I think is is really bad. It's sort of degenerated, and the reason why I think it's degenerated, and I'm actually saying this in reference to Euripides, believe it or not, is because it it's doing fan service. It's become too self-referential. It's too aware of itself. And I think that's a criticism that Nietzsche is making of Euripides because Euripides is explicitly trying to write to the audience. Quote, How did an excessive respect for his audience lead him to treat his audience with disrespect? Exactly. Um, I'm not going to bother flicking through the book and trying to find it, but there's a quote in the book where he is he's, he's saying... He basically dismisses the idea that art should be about the audience or the spectator. Yeah, which, yeah. He, which, which I loved. Yeah, he says, like, uh, it, it shouldn't matter. Like, who cares if the majority of people like it, if it's shit. Mm. You should be appealing to that one person in the audience, in the entire audience, even if there's one person with, like, the highest level of taste and they can see the genius of it but everyone else dislikes it, then you know you've done a good job. Yeah. But it, I think it's... Part of that is that he saw himself as being that person... Mm. He, he, he look. I agree with like so much stuff that he says in this, but uh, like he, he ends up sort of critiquing it, being like, "Yeah, this is sort of like a a lot of this was like an imposition of my own ego." Uh, <laughs> I I understand tragedy better than everyone else. So yeah, yeah, pretty much. But I I love the dick swinging energy. That's part of why I love nature. Yeah, I don't think it's a criticism because. That just is part of what's so good about it. Yeah. Like, it, it works. It makes it work. Yeah. Um, so, for, again, reiterating, Euripides sucks because social realist and focuses on, like, everyday sort of, like, social, political concerns rather than sort of, like, these grand mythic narratives and themes. Yeah, and um, he has a... He has a he has a resolution to his tragedies, which Nietzsche hates. He employs the... Um, probably saying this wrong, the deus ex machina, yeah. right? Which is like literally in like, so I read Medea, I know, like he, at the end a god comes down and like literally all the irresolvable plot holes of the tragedy are just resolved mm. because a god comes down. And you see, so Nietzsche hates that because it's like optimistic and it's rational. It's like, well, that's not reality. Like mm. it's kind of this, I'm not going to say the word myth, but um, that I, I hate Hollywood films where there's a happy ending because it's not, it's not actually realistic. And Nietzsche would probably say the same thing. Yeah, like whenever there's like some big blockbuster movie, like there's so much of Marvel films where it's like this guy is going to come and destroy the entire world, <laughs> but these people, this the hero wants to stop him. Yeah, what's going to happen? Oh, we, oh, dude, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder what's going to happen. I don't think the film's going to end with everyone dead. Yeah, um, but let's. I feel like we we should hit on the Socratic thing a bit more. Because he sees that through Euripides kind of introduces this idea of the Socratic. Um, and he's, uh, Nietzsche says that the Socratic is what killed the productive sort of dichotomy of Apollonian and the Dionysian with the introduction of the Socratic. Because it's sort of, like, like you said, it reduces everything to rationality. Like what's, what's good, what's beautiful, what's true is what's knowable. Yeah, right? it's all one and the same. Yeah, like he's against instincts, uh, completely against instincts in art. Um, and that for nature is horrible because art is fundamentally instinctual. Yeah. Um, but also it's 
this new Socratic paradigm, like Euripides hit and Socrates hit, and suddenly everybody in Athens uh, who would be into that old sort of tragic way of doing things became like enamoured by it. Um, and he says that uh, Socrates in his death became the ideal for noble Greek youth, most of all Plato. But Plato himself, apparently per nature, um, had penned a couple tragedies uh, when he was a very young man. And to join, to become a follower of Socrates, he had to destroy them. Sorry for the abrupt ending there, guys. Um, our recording equipment seemed to stop about halfway through, uh, but that's okay. We'll just release the first 45 minutes as Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy Part 1 and stay tuned for Birth of Tragedy Part 2. But while we've got you, uh, please remember to rate the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen. There's also a YouTube channel. Some of you may not know. The episodes are also on YouTube as well. Um, or please reach out to us at Instagram, at Ideas Matter Pod. We love to hear from our listeners. Give us those rates and subscribes. Rates and subscribes and likes and comments, please. Thanks, Yang. Thank you.